Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session on using unit time to improve institutional efficiency. I am Lucy Appert. I'm the moderator for the session, and I'm going to turn it over to Tomasz Mueller and Zuzana Mulrova, who are presenting. Tomas comes to us from Purdue University, and Zuzana is with UniTime SRO. Uh, they are going to be pre presenting together. Um, they will answer messages in the chat. Um, if you have questions, they'll also take questions that are remaining at the end. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you. Good morning or afternoon and welcome at our presentation about the unit time, how to use this tool to improve institutional efficiency. My name is Zuzana Milerova, as Lucy introduced me. I mainly do support for unit time. My colleague Tomáš Muller is the technical lead of the project, and he will give the second part of this presentation. Uh, during our session, I will first briefly introduce unit time and then dive into the benefits of using it at a higher education institution. The third part of our session will be devoted to a specific use case, the enrollment growth simulation that Tomáš worked on at Purdue University. So we will swap seats in the middle. What is unit time? It is a comprehensive academic scheduling solution. It comprises of five components now. Course timetabling, examination timetabling, student scheduling, instructor scheduling, and event management. Unitime is open source, web-based, and written in Java using technologies such as Spring or Hibernate. It allows for distributed or centralized data entry and distributed or centralized timetabling. Users can enter the system with different roles and permissions. The Unitime project became a part of the apparel portfolio in March 2015. To speak about the benefits of timetabling, we should first clarify what we mean by timetabling. What is course timetabling? By course timetabling, we mean the process of assigning times and rooms to classes. The main goal is to create a good course timetable for students so that they can study. Uh, but there is restrictions and preferences come into play, such as the properties of the courses, like size or necessary equipment the availability and preferences of instructors. We need information about students, which courses they want to take. Apparently, the courses of the same students should not overlap in time. We can take this information about students from curricula or pre-registration or last year's class enrollments. Other restrictions, such as rooms at the institution, has available for the instructor instructions. The second important component of unit time that helps to improve efficiency of an institution is student scheduling. By student scheduling, we mean enrolling students into classes in a way that maximizes the ability for students to get the courses they need. The process supported by unit time is as follows. First, a student fills in his or her course requests, which is the sheet that you can see in the screenshot. So a student fills in course requests, including priorities, alternative courses, or free time requests. In the second step, uh, unit time creates a schedule of classes for the student that meets the student's needs. In the third step, the student can modify his or her schedule of classes. So these have been the two main components, course timetabling and student scheduling. And why would anyone use a system such as Unitime for academic scheduling? Here is a list of possible reasons. We will go into details about each of them in the following slides, but in the meantime, you can think of what do you imagine under each of these items? So software such as Unitime can help an institution use limited resources more efficiently. 
make the timetabling or scheduling process more transparent and sustainable. Secure certain fairness and satisfaction with the timetable. Minimize student conflicts to help students receive degrees on time. It can help to adapt to changes, for example, changes in curricula or available facilities. Or it can help with modeling what if scenarios. So do you have some ideas about what these could be? Let's talk about each of those. The first item in the list was to use resources more efficiently. By resources, we mean rooms with our equipment, but not only rooms. For example, instructors can also be viewed as limited resources. As for rooms, unit time helps to better meet requirements and preferences for rooms or room equipment. It takes into account the travel times between locations. We have seen at institutions using unit time that they could utilize their rooms better with unit time than they could when timetabling by hand. For example, a college of sports could stop renting sports facility because they fit in the remaining facilities. As for instructors, unit time helps to meet the instructor's restrictions and preferences. It automatically checks for conflicts in the timetable. It can minimize travel between different locations, such as buildings at far ends of the campus. In the instructor assignment component, unit time checks the teaching code, instructors' qualifications, their preferences for courses they would like to teach or for times of the week. If you efficiently assign your existing instructors to classes, you might reduce the need for new hires. So this would save you money too. With a timetabling system such as Unitime, you capture the inputs for course timetabling. These inputs can be revised at a later day if, for example, someone from the dean's office wants to find out what why some classes ended up at less convenient times or why a certain room was left empty on Friday afternoons. The timetable is built based on these inputs, so all the requirements and preferences need to be in there and are available for review. The computer does not take sides, so that's another part of the furnace. The computer does not try to give better times to an unpleasant instructor to avoid criticism or bad rooms to someone it does not like. In this sense, it's fair to all the parties. There are various notions of fairness embedded in unit time. For example, unit time keeps the good and the bad times balanced across departments. No department gets only good times or only bad times, unless it is strictly required by the users. Or the time preferences are normalized. So if someone has only one favorite time, it has slightly higher weight than if this time is just one of 10 favorite times. The recording of all preferences and requirements is good not only for transparency, but uh, also for sustainability of the timetabling and scheduling processes. Uh, most of the inputs can be reused for future semesters. If there is a new scheduling person, this person already has a lot of information for timetabling and scheduling, so the knowledge transfer is much easier. Uh, and we will talk about the changes in a later slide. Student scheduling. Student scheduling helps an institution fulfill its obligations towards students. First, it helps students get the courses they need. The course timetable is created with students in mind to minimize overlaps between courses of the same students. Then, the available space is monitored during pre-registration, so capacities can be increased and new sections added if needed. This helps to resolve issues on the side of the institution before students start making adjustments. Student scheduling helps to equalize opportunities, improve fairness and reduce stress. Students coming to pre-register or enroll into classes at a later time 
have the same chance of getting into a course as the students who got in early. All students get their top priority courses and uh, they go get enough courses to meet their minimum credit requirement. Their schedule of classes works with substitute courses, free time requests, or preferences for certain sections of a course. Further criteria are considered during student scheduling, such as distributing students equally among sections of a course, including lunch breaks, keeping the schedule of classes compact, or accommodating students with special needs, for example, preventing unnecessary travel. There can be courses that have limits lower than the demand, so not all the students can get in. In these cases, students can be prioritized so that the students who need the courses for their degree, for whom the courses are critical, have priority over students for whom these courses are optional. Similarly, students may get higher priorities for other reasons, such as being affiliates or honor students. Now the changes. Unit time helps to adapt to changes, both small and large. For the small changes, it is easier to add a new section of a course and find appropriate time and location for it, or to add a whole course. Such small changes are made manually. The timetabling manager has control over the changes, with unit time providing suggestions as to suitable locations and times, and warning about possible conflicts. When it comes to larger changes, it might not be possible to make them one by one by the timetabling manager. For example, when a tornado damages a building or there is damaged statics after a flood, it is not possible to find new locations for all classes from that building one by one. For that, automated timetabling can be used in a mode that minimizes changes. In other words, unit time solves the problem but moves as few as the remaining classes as possible in this process. The users can choose which types of changes are more acceptable than others. For example, they can choose that it's required that the times stay the same while allowing to get locations farther away from the damaged building. Or they can um, choose that keeping the times is just a preference with higher weight on the closeness of the new location. So they want to get the classes as close as possible to the previous location, even if it means that they change the time of the class. So it's very, very variable. Uh, and the last part, and the last reason why to use unit time is running what if scenarios. What if scenarios institution can model a situation when a room or a whole building becomes unavailable. For example, how many rooms they need to rent elsewhere if they need to renovate an existing building. Another scenario is when an institution decides to change the start times or lengths of their classes. For example, having four, 50 minutes lessons instead of 45 minutes or moving the beginning of the first class in a day from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. A much larger scenario is moving from semesters to trimesters. A recent what-if scenario has handled a massive change in the room capacities, reducing the real or usable capacity of each room to almost 50% to allow for social distancing. Overall, the what-if scenarios can help for the future with smaller or larger changes. The way the scenarios are run in unit time is as follows. We start with historic data and adjust them based on mo the modeling objectives. For that, the whole academic session, that is how we call semester in unit time, can be duplicated or copied to a different instance of unit time. One session can be duplicated several times for different setups. If larger changes are needed, the XML exports or imports or Python scripts can be used for data manipulation. For example, we can reduce the room capacities to 50% or change the start times with a script. And now I would like to ask Tomáš Miller to tell us about the use case that he participated in at Purdue University.
So hello, my name is Tomáš. I will be talking about a simulation or more precisely a series of simulations that we have done at Purdue University last December. At our West Lafayette campus, we have almost 44,500 of students, almost 34,000 of them are undergraduate. We offer a little over 8,000 courses annually. In these simulations, we have been considering the projected growth of our enrollments to go up by close to 5,000 of students within the next six years. These projected increases have not been the same across the whole university, but are varying a lot based on the college and major. For the input data that we have used for the simulations, we have used our fall 2019 census data, including all the information that we have to build both the course timetable and student schedules within unit time. This includes all the requirements and preferences for the courses, as well as the student course demands. Besides the data that we already have in unit time, we have worked with the admissions to give us recruitment targets for the following years. These targets have been extended to projections of the number of students we would have in each year, including the students that we already have and that are moving towards getting their degree divided by academic areas and majors. So for instance, in the table below, here is an example of management majors, the fall 2019 data and the fall 2025 projections. You can see that we are projecting an increase of about 400 students in, in the management as total, but each major has a different counts. So go, some go up and a bit or some, like the general management, the GMGT, uh, have a significant increase. Based on this data, as the next step, we have used unit time to estimate course enrollments. This is the number of students we expect to take each of the courses. For this, we use the, the fall 2019 enrollment data scaled by the relative changes in student counts in each major and classification. These numbers are useful to estimate how many sections each course will need. For our simulations, we have provided the registrar office a table like, like this one below, showing the increased enrollment in each course, and they have helped us to decide how the increased enrollment is likely to be accommodated by each of the courses. For example, we can make some sections larger, needing a bigger room, or we can add more sections. Or quite often, there can be a combination of, of both. For instance, a lecture can be larger, but a few more labs may need to be added. After the course time, courses have been updated, we have run the course timetabling solver of unit time to see whether a timetable can be built or where we need to add more teaching space. We have done various scenarios to determine the impact of future plans. For, exam for example, we have considered adding more evening classes or building new rooms of various types and sizes. We have also used the student scheduling solver to validate the results. This is making sure that the students would be able to get the courses they needed. For, for this, we used again the fall 2019 data, the student course requests, but we have scaled them to match the projections. Here is a table of our course timetable and results from a few simulations. In the first column, we have the fall 2019 timetable using the actual data. The base simulations were, were based on the fall 2020 projections, and there is also a, a run that has more, more evening classes. In the fall 2023, we were not able to build a timetable without adding more space. In the table, we have two examples. In the first column, only a single large active learning room of size 180 has been added. That was the bare minimum. In the second example, we have added one large lecture room of size 480, two large le active learning rooms of size 180, uh, two PC labs and two Linux labs. In the table below, you can see the basic optimization criteria of the course timetabling solver and how they have been met. The number of assigned sections has increased because, the edit, because of the edit sections. And in all cases, we, are able, we were able to compute a, a complete timetable. So all the, all the classes have their times and rooms at the end. The number of student conflicts, time preference, the, 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 the way how the time preferences and room preferences have been satisfied are about the same with some variation. So the outcomes were very co comparable with the actual fall 2019 timetable. 
There are, of course, more reports that can be generated from such a simulation. Here is, for instance, the room utilization of our four biggest classroom, plus the new large lecture room that will be built in some of the scenarios. You can see that the room utilization is getting quite high in some cases. It is counted as the frequency of the time when the room is being used during the work time, between times between 7.30 in the morning to 5.30 in, in the afternoon. There are, of course, various outcomes that can come from such a simulation. In some cases, also depending on the level of details that is used, as well as the various what-if scenarios that have been tried out. Excuse me. We can, for instance, identify which uh, areas are uh, needs, uh, which areas need some resource adjustments, what rooms with their types and sizes would need to be built and how quickly, what are the faculty needs, new hires and so on. Impact of curriculum changes could be studied as well. We can also study how the demand is balanced between fall and spring semester or for we, we can plan for contingency and contingencies for courses where it is just not possible to provide enough seats. If the course cannot grow any, any larger, we can, for instance, uh, make space in some substitute courses instead. So that was for the presentation. Have you had any, any questions? Uh, I have not seen any in the chat. Okay. So yeah, if there are no, no questions. Hmm? Yes, we I'm have sure. about, yeah, we have about seven minutes if people did want to ask questions. I think it's really um, impressive um, features you have for dealing with the uncertainties of fall mm -hmm. um, and the types of scenarios we're going to have to um, mm -hmm. look at. Does anyone have yeah. any questions that would like to ask? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other simulations that we are doing just, just now is because of the COVID when we are actually reducing a lot of space in, in, in our classrooms. It's, I think it's, yeah, the, the largest class could be 150. So anything larger would, would have to be online, which frees up some space and we can move some other classes to, to larger rooms. But of course there are many more smaller classes than there is larger, larger space. So there are also some additional things that will need to happen like for some of the classes, they will need to alternate attendance. Some, some students would come up even weeks, some odd weeks, or if the class is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then they can swap like Monday, Wednesday, one group, Wednesday, Friday, the other group, or, or things like that. And it seems like our faculty is, is quite creative in that. Yes, mm -hmm. I, think, I think faculty tend to be worried more about this than maybe what, mm -hmm. what's gonna happen. They can't get their minds past the, the situation. And it's great to know that we can reassure them and saying there, people are thinking about this. You don't have to worry about this. Um, but um, I, think, I think another, another um, situation that a lot of faculty are worried about is students having, um, and Susanna was talking about this, students having back-to-back -back classes, um, like, or they may have remote learning. Um, so the ability to look at a student's schedule and understand you know, common patterns for students, yeah. because um, if there are, um, a lot of introductory courses that are moved to remote and then students have an, a face-to-face -face class in the middle of that. Um, it's, it's crazy. Well, we've got a couple of questions in the, um, in the chat. Mm -hmm. One says, amazing how much effort you put into uni time, how much it's evolved over the years. I remember the presentation in Baltimore in 2015. Purdue is lucky to be able to invest in such software development. And Adrian said, that's a lot to take in. How long have you been using this at Purdue? Well, it was originally developed for Purdue, or uh, it was a cooperation between Masaryk University, Charles University here in, in the Czech Republic and Purdue University, which funded the, the, the initial research. I think when, when we started 2006, 2006, and we only started with the course titling of the large lecture rooms, which was like seven or nine, seven to 900 classes of, of the truly the, the biggest rooms, which yeah, they're, yeah, they were getting to the point where it was not possible to do it by hand. And we've added additional functionality later on that the student scheduling is, is, is the most recent from, from the mix. So, yeah, and, and it, I think it, it became open source in 2007 and we joined Apereo in 2015. And yeah, it's, it's, it's been growing and there are more schools using it. We still don't get as many of the outside contributions that we would like to, but 
it's it's a complicated system, I, I, I guess, and it's, it takes time for, for someone to actually contribute. But yeah, there is a lot of institutions that seem to be interested in. Yeah, the question said, are you literally using this across all of the course offerings at Purdue? Yes, yeah, it's being used to, to build the, the course timetable for, for, for the whole university or for the, the whole, for all the courses at, at the West Lafayette campus and the, the other campuses are using Unitime too. And it's, it's not built together. It's like we build the, the large lecture room problem first, which is done by the registrar, which now is close to a thousand classes and that each department is responsible for their own timetable on, on top of that. And some of them still can just require rooms and times and it, it just makes sure that, that it fits. But yeah, many of them are, are more at least letting it assign rooms or just provide a couple of options of, for, for each class when, about the times. <laughs> are you, yeah, are you good at maths? I would assume you are, <laughs> I would assume you are. Yeah, actually started with, with, with trying to, or thinking about course timetabling as, as my PhD, so, and, and part of that, part of the research, I was a PhD student that was taken, uh, taken in with, with the research group that was, that they were, where we were thinking about unit time. You all offer, uh, this past year, you all had a contest, right? A timetabling contest. Yes. Do you yes. want to say just a word or two about that? Yeah, that's the Internet, uh, International Timetabling Competition 2019. It's, it's uh, organized together with the PATAT research. It's, it's a conference practices and theory of automated timetabling, which happens every other year. They have, and this is like, I think, third competition which is concerning about course timetabling. But I think out of those that, that have been, this is, this is more uh, the most complex in the sense that we are actually using real data that, that the other researchers can, can try to build their own solvers. So it's, it, it's the course timetabling with, with some students requesting courses. So there needs to be some sectioning of students as well. Yeah, we have had over 200 people registered at our competition website because you had to register to be able to download the instances. And yeah, we have five finalists. Originally, we were planning to have an award ceremony at the Patat Conference in Bruges in August, but the, the Patat Conference has been postponed by a year because of the COVID. So we are going, it, going to do that online on September 2nd. Really? Yes. yes. We also had the Apparel Foundation sponsoring the open source prize. So out of the, 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 out, out of the five finalists, we actually have two solvers that have been open sourced. And one of them will, will win the Apparel open source prize, which is, I think, $500. That's so exciting. So I would urge mm -hmm. everyone to take a look at the newsletter and um, go to your website as well. Um, and I guess this competition will be again in two years, maybe in 2021, maybe. Or no? I don't know. It, it yeah. may be a, a different problem again because it's, right. it, it still takes some time. And it, even if, it's, if the competition is over, there is still a research going on because it also helps to to have some, some benchmark data from not just one institution because most of the research so far has been like, yeah, we have a problem at our university and we have collected some data and we'll try to solve it and it ends with a research paper and, and, and that's it usually. So we are trying to, to get that a little more towards the, the practice. And that, that's, that could be seen on, 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 the, on the data intensives at the competition too, they are not, not easy. And, quite large and for, for some of them with, with a lot of constraints though we try to simplify it a little bit in the like how much time it takes to develop a solver not uh, the complexity of the problem itself. Wow okay um, what, we have one more question I see we're like a teeny bit over time but let me just grab this because I think you can answer it. So it's just Java JDK Tomcat server and a database on the server side is MySQL a must or is another server, another database server possible? And we are, we are yeah. using Hibernate. Actually, yeah, most Hibernate, of our yeah. production instances are using Oracle, but we use MySQL as well. And recently, we have also added Postgres SQL because yeah, you need to have a, a, some SQLs to make actually to populate the database, and then you just let the uh, Hibernate to to do the the dialect. Great. Great. Um, thanks. Okay, great. So um, the recording of the session will be available. 
Um, and we um, and our presenters can follow up with anyone who's interested. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much for presenting on Unitime today. And I'm going to let you guys free to go back into the rest of the conference. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you.